Good morning. May the Lord bless you and give you an abundance of peace. My text this morning is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus, answering him, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. I invite you to read the parable together aloud with me, beginning in verse 41, together aloud. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Thank you. Verse 43, Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Verse 48, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The parables of Jesus are little stories that explain the big story. They interpret, they interpret reality in real time on the spot as reality unfolds. In the parable of the two debtors that we just read, Simon is the small-time debtor. He loves little. The woman from the city is the big-time debtor. She loves much. And so my question to all of us today is, where are we in the story? Where are you in the story? How great is your debt? How great is your devotion. In the red is the title and theme of the sermon, the Pharisee and the prostitute. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we ask you to open your word to our hearts and open our hearts to your word. Give us understanding and insight and, and help us to hear the story uh, as you intended it to be heard in such a way that we will find ourselves in the story, whether we are more like Simon the Pharisee 
are more like the woman at the feet of Jesus. And help us and lead us to the feet of Jesus, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We begin with Simon. Small is his debt. Small is his devotion. It was kind of Simon to invite Jesus to dinner. But he seems to have ulterior motives. Jesus is a public figure with a great reputation of a prophet, as you can see in verses 16 and 17. Normally, a host would greet such a guest with a kiss and then anoint his head with oil and then get a slave to wash his feet or at least provide a bowl of water and a towel so that the guest can wash himself. But Simon short changes Jesus all of these essential services. No kiss of greeting, no water for his feet, and no oil for his head. Instead of honoring Jesus, he seems to be snubbing him and checking out his prophetic credentials. Simon is the small time debtor in the parable. He feels neither guilt nor gratitude in the presence of Jesus. Forgiven little, he scrimps on hospitality. And instead of judging himself, he judges Jesus and the woman at his feet. If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. These are his private thoughts, but Jesus reads his mind and answers him with the story of the two debtors. One owed 500 days wages and the other 50, and the creditor forgave both of them, which one will love him more? And Simon, master of the obvious, answers correctly, I suppose the one who was forgiven the greater debt. And now all eyes turn to the woman at Jesus' feet. Luke introduces her as a woman of the city, and that is putting it kindly. What on earth would drive a city woman from the red light district into the house of a Pharisee and during dinner too? In that social and religious setting, the Pharisee's table is his temple. It is considered holy. And the meal is almost as sacred as our holy communion. This is the last place on earth for a prostitute. Woman, keep away from that house. You are not welcome. You are not wanted. You are not invited. And so, what on earth drove this woman to that house? I answer in one word, desperation. Great is her debt. Great is her devotion. In breach of all social and religious norms, she barges into that holy house and creates a scandal. Why? Because she has a need that only Jesus can meet. And Jesus is there in that house. 
She's in the red. She owes a debt she cannot pay. This can be interpreted as a debt of guilt or gratitude or lingering shame or a deep need of assurance. But if you ask me, it's more than gratitude because Jesus doesn't tell her, you're welcome, but your sins are forgiven. And besides, if it were only gratitude, she could wait outside the door. But guilt cannot wait. Guilt, as C.S. Lewis describes it, is like a bear clawing your chest, not from the outside where you could defend yourself, but from the inside. Do you know the feeling? There is only one place where you can find relief, and that is at the feet of Jesus. This woman is desperate. She cannot wait another hour. And she is oblivious to everything but Jesus. She doesn't judge the Pharisee as he judges her. She probably respects him and esteems him highly as an icon of holiness and purity in the community, while she is the very opposite. But no amount of scorn and contempt from the Pharisee or his guests can stop her. Her business is with Jesus and Jesus alone. She has an errand. Being a streetwise city woman, she may well have observed that Jesus' feet have not been washed. There's no water, there's no basin, there's no towel. So she does the necessary. Everything that Simon withheld from Jesus, she provides to the utmost. There's no oil for his head. She brings ointment. There's no water for his feet. She sheds tears. There's no towel for wiping. She unveils herself and lets her hair down. Shocking. She washes Jesus' feet. She dries them with her hair. She covers them with kisses nonstop and anoints them with ointment. Disgusting, outrageous. She crosses every red line. It is beyond our capacity to grasp the shock and the scandal this caused to Simon and his guests. Like the Taliban in Afghanistan, Judaism back then banished women from virtually all public life. Women were to self-quarantine at home most of the time, and if they did venture out, they were supposed to wrap themselves up like bachang bachang dumplings, beyond recognition. And two, they were supposed to social distance from men. A man could divorce his wife for speaking too freely in public with another man. But this woman breaks all the rules. 
As her desperation, so is her devotion. Extreme. Extrinsic. Sorry, I'm confusing two words. I'm trying to impress you with my alliterations. So I get my due punishment. Extreme, extravagant, eccentric is her devotion. Until she hears the word of assurance from the lips of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She came in great debt, in great love, and with great faith. She left with great forgiveness, great salvation, and great peace. And that's how we should come to church, whether on site or online in great love, in great faith. And none of us should ever leave without great forgiveness and great peace. She leaves her sins at the feet of Jesus. He gathers them up and carries them to the cross. She washed his feet with her tears. He washed away her sins with his blood. She owed a debt she could not pay. Jesus paid it all. Great debt, great devotion. And now, where are you in the story? How great is your debt? How great is your devotion? Whether you're like more like the Pharisee or more like the woman, we are all in the red. The story and the parable within the story invite us to examine ourselves in light of these two Contrasting responses to Jesus, Simon's and the woman's. The Pharisee scrimps on hospitality to Jesus. The woman is extravagant in her devotion to Jesus. The Pharisee invites Jesus into his home. The woman invites Jesus into her heart. Is Jesus your house guest? Or is he your hot guest? Do we scrimp on devotion? Do we skip church for no good reason? We do sympathy for those who are online and can't be with us today. We understand your situation. But we must remember online is second best to the gathering. Jesus is present with his people in the gathered church in a way that we cannot meet him alone. Both are important. Private devotion at home and worshiping together in the assembly as often as we can, especially understanding our current situation. But whether you are online or on site, what are you seeking in this worship experience? The woman doesn't perform a song and dance at the feet of Jesus. I thank God that COVID-19 has confirmed for me a lesson that I learned a long time ago, that singing is not the essence of worship. 
singing is only one expression of worship. You can worship without singing, as this woman does. And you can sing without worshiping, as we often do. But you cannot worship without surrender. The essence of worship is surrender, total surrender to God. And this woman demonstrates that for us in this great act of devotion where she withholds nothing but pours out everything at the feet of Jesus. And so what will you bring to the feet of Jesus? Your sins? Yes, absolutely, without hesitation. But where are the tears? Where's the ointment? How great is your devotion? Is it casual and calculated like Simon's? You don't have to be extravagant. You don't have to be extreme. Unless you can't help it like the woman. And God forbid that we should ever fake it. What do you bring to the feet of Jesus? Great faith? Great debt? Great devotion? What do you take from the feet of Jesus? Great forgiveness? Great peace? Great salvation? This is what is on offer Every time we gather, every time we meet the Lord, Simon passes up the offer. Will you? What is your errand here today? Are you judging yourself or your neighbor? The Pharisee is so busy judging Jesus and the woman that he cannot see the log in his own eye. The woman is so preoccupied with her own sins that she could not possibly imagine passing judgment on anyone else. Judge not, said Jesus that you be not judged. A poor man made ends meet by selling odds and ends door to door. And sometimes his customers paid him with bad coins. And he noticed that the coins were bad, but he didn't say anything. He accepted them, and he made excuses for the customers. Maybe they're poor. Maybe they don't know the coins are bad. And when his time came to die, he lifted his eyes to heaven, and he said, Lord, please accept me. I'm a bad coin. And the Lord answered him and said, how can I judge anyone who has never judged his neighbor? Judge not, that you be not judged. There's only one person you can judge, and that is yourself. We are all bad coins. I, worst of all. Maximus the Confessor said, He who busies himself with the sins of others or judges his brother on suspicion has not 
yet even begun to repent or to examine himself so as to discover his own sins which are truly heavier than a great lump of lead. This is the Pharisee's piety, so busy judging the sins of others that we cannot even see the weight, cannot even feel the burden of our own sins. Was it guilt that brought you here today? How many red lines will you cross to be with Jesus, to encounter his forgiving heart, to hear his healing word? Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. A young man from China studied in an American seminary which I'm tempted to call a cemetery. A seminary that was steeped in liberal theology and the social gospel. And this poor young man struggled under a heavy load of guilt. But he prayed and he had a vision there flashed before my mind, scene after scene of my sins, he wrote. Even the forgotten, hidden sins. I saw myself weighed down almost to the breaking point with my load of sin. I dropped to my knees in humility and pleaded with the Lord to cleanse me with his precious blood. And then he heard the Lord say, Son, your sins are forgiven. From now on, you shall be named John. And he went back to China, and in the years that followed, a hundred thousand Chinese came to Christ through the ministry of that man called John. John Sung, who also brought revival to Singapore and Southeast Asia. Was it guilt that brought you here? Blessed are you. You've come to the right place. Don't suppress it. Surface it. Confess it. Bring all your sins to the feet of Jesus. Guilt and godly sorrow are gifts that drive us to Jesus. Animals don't feel it. Some humans have ceased to feel it like animals they can change partners from time to time and bite and devour each other and never feel any guilt don't let that happen to you drink the guilt down to the dregs at the feet of Jesus and then bring it back up and pour it at his feet if only we knew what to do with guilt. If we only knew how great a gift it is. The conviction of sin. The godless sorrow that Paul speaks about. That leads us to repentance. Guilt is one of my best friends. Because he brings me to Jesus. Where I can find relief. Where the bear that claws my chest from the inside is cast out by the word of forgiveness that comes from the man.
called Jesus. Pray for the gift of tears. Yes, tears are a gift. Tears are a second baptism. Tears of gratitude. Tears of repentance. Tears are a language God understands. A silent prayer. A sigh. A groan. A quailing of the heart at the feet of Jesus. Is that part of your spiritual life? Or have you drowned it out with distractions? Is it love and gratitude for sins already forgiven that brings you here? Rejoice, fall at the feet of Jesus. Fifty years on, I'm still paying my debt of gratitude, a huge debt of love and gratitude for so many sins. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed him. I needed him to wash my sins away. How will you express your gratitude? How will you honor Jesus? Thank God for whatever you dropped in the bag. May God accept your offering. But is that all? Where's your heart? Would you please stand to your feet if you're able, whether here on site or online. And let's take a few moments. You may wish to fall on your knees at the feet of Jesus and wait in his presence. Pray for the gift of tears for the feet of Jesus. May he wash your soul with his precious blood. Would you take a moment, examine yourself in light of the woman's response to Jesus as opposed to the Pharisees' response? Where are you in the story? At the head of the table, or at the feet of Jesus. Would you move now? To the lowly place, the holiest place of all. Not the Pharisee's table, but the floor. Holy ground. Where Jesus rests his weary feet. Would you wash them? with your tears. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us where we have judged others without noticing our own faults. Forgive us where we have shortchanged you the honor that you alone deserve, where we have scrimped on quiet time, skipped church, with no good reason. Forgive us for, sometimes we forget the price you paid to forgive us, to redeem us, and the huge debt of gratitude we could never pay. Help us. And 
the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.